This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Once again, another edition of Thursday Coast with the founder of Daily Coast, the largest online progressive community, community, and the founder of Civics with the Q and the host of the popular podcast, The Brief, Marcos Melitzis. How are you, buddy? Doing good. How are you doing, Mark? Just fine. Just fine. Um, we've not, you have been doing extensive coverage on the Ukraine since it happened. And, and it's not gotten as much mainstream coverage with all the Trump news and now with the queen uh, passing away. But what has gotten through some of the mainstream headlines, one of the headlines that has gotten through is that Russia has been set back significantly and some are even going so far to say that Russia is not actively losing this war. Can But I trust you because you've been on top of this really daily uh, at, at his regular blog on Daily Coast, post, uh, coast.dailycoast.com. You can go right to Mark Coast's post right there, coast.dailycoast.com. But what uh, what is your perspective on this? What What is taking place? Is this, is the tide turning? And is it turning uh, significantly and uh, irrevocably? Uh, I mean, the answer is yes. The the quick answer, the quick answer is yes. The, the more complicated answer is that Russia has been losing since about the first week of the war. And it has been systematically been degraded. Um, and we saw that early on in the war that Russia had to pull off their attempt to take the capital Kiev and uh, several cities in the north of the country. And they try to sort of re- focus on the east and the south and uh the east is areas that that um they're adjoining to russia and they're russia speaking most of ukraine is russia speaking but it was sort of the excuse that russia had to create a you know to to spur on a breakaway movement in those republics and so that the goal was then to take over the entire eastern corner of of ukraine in a section called the Donbas. They've been making gains, but in the last five, six months, they, they made a couple hundred square, uh, uh, square miles of gains. I mean, it was very, very minor. So it was, they were inching forward and Ukraine had the strategy of, of surrendering territory for blood. So Russia was advancing, but it was advancing at huge, huge cost. So it, it basically it ground the war down to attritional. French warfare it looked a lot like World War World War One, actually, and so, but Russia was still pushing. You know, they're still gaining a few kilometers here, a few kilometers there, a little town here, and so there was sort of this illusion, if you were looking at it simplistically, that okay, Russia is still moving forward, but they were moving forward at a pace that to meet their objectives would take them about two hundred and fifty years. I did the math once, so it it wasn't <laughs> they were moving, <laughs> but. Man, it, somebody actually did even more math and found that a snail would have made bigger gains in the last six months than the Russian army. But it was coming at a huge cost. It was coming at a huge cost to Ukrainian defenders, and it was coming at, coming at huge cost to, to Russians. Now, the difference being that there was a lot more Ukrainians. Ukrainians have over a million people um, in their armed forces, and they are, they are um, they're mobilized for war. Russia only has about 150,000 troops in Ukraine. And that was always, from the beginning, it was always my number one argument why Russia was going to win, uh, Russia was going to lose, is that they never had the concentration of forces necessary to actually win an offensive war. So they've been attrited over time. And Putin does not, he refuses to call a national mobilization in Russia. He refuses to call it a war. So that even means that if you're a contract soldier, contract Russian soldier in Ukraine, you can be like, you know what? Screw this. I'm out. And they can't keep him there because Putin hasn't declared a war. So Russians are there. Basically, uh, now a lot of them get, get, get strong armed. They get threatened to, to stick around, but it just means that, that they don't have that critical mass. And so what happened this last weekend 
not not you know two days ago, but last weekend, is that Ukraine launched an offensive in the south, and they had spent. This is very clever. They had spent three months saying, "We're going to attack Kherson. We're going to attack Kherson." And so Russia was like, "Oh crap! They're going to attack Kherson," and they rushed about forty percent of their of their of their forces in Ukraine to the southern region of uh, of Ukraine. And now here's a, sort of the trick: three bridges connect that region to the rest of Ukraine. To so. Basically, Ukraine called in, you know, they, 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 they said, we're going to attack, we're going to attack. Russia flooded in, and then Ukraine systematically des- destroyed those three bridges connecting that region. So those Russian forces are effectively cut off. They can't be resupplied. Now, helicopters can bring supplies in. They're using barges across rivers. But it's a very inefficient way to, to maintain. And people, again, have done math. And we're talking about they're getting 20 25% of the supplies they need. To maintain what looks to be about between thirty and forty thousand troops in this in this region, so that was clever in its own right. And we all thought this was a real offensive. Like Russia just walked into this trap. We all saw this trap coming. Russia apparently the only people in the world that didn't realize this was a trap, and they walked right into it. But what was really clever and really unexpected from the outside. Is that Ukraine had a second offensive force in the north and north northeastern part of the country, and that's what you're hearing about. They punched through, they punched through Russian lines, and they've taken about eight thousand square kilometers, almost three thousand square miles of territory in a single week. Russian troops abandoning, surrendering in mass. Uh, Hundred, I think, at last count, I saw almost over four hundred armored vehicles have been left behind by Russia. That uh, in good condition, not not destroyed, but they literally just jumped out of their tanks, jumped out of their armored vehicles, and just grabbed, got in the cars, and drove away. And um, so that's that's the big sort of shock to people who are, are, are tracking the war. It's a big shock to Putin, obviously. It uh, it's a huge morale boost to to Ukraine because it's the first time that they've shown that they can take massive amounts of territory back. On offensive, on the offensive. When we look at the battle at Kiev, Russia pretty much just gave up. The the defensive lines were so strong that that Russia realized they could maintain them, and they they just they're like, you know, we're out of here. This was the cause of Ukrainian offensive uh, counter offensive action. So it's a, it's a different sort of feeling. They're using uh, Western weapons, NATO supplied weapons, and um, Russia has had. To completely once again recalibrate, and they're on the they're on the defensive everywhere. Even in that south, where those Russian troops are cut off. You know, I just I was just reading it before we came on that uh, Ukraine announced the capture of several towns, getting closer and closer to that main city of Kherson in that region. So they are advancing everywhere, and to the point where even the Russian propagandists can't ignore it anymore. So we're seeing on Russian state television. Where you're finally having guests saying, "Why aren't we calling this a war? This is a war. This, we can't win this thing." And there's a sense of defeatism that's sort of creeping in to the Russian discussion. And that, uh, you know, Russia's a cornered animal. You never, you know, you never want to underestimate what a wounded animal trapped in the corner will do, right? So this thing's not over by, not over immediately. But now I'm starting to see a scenario where this thing might be over by Christmas. What about surrender? And I know you've written about this as well. Some Russian troops are surrendering or seeking to surrender. And they're there. There are actual the Ukrainians are sharing surrender leaflets and surrender cards uh, <laughs> with the um, um I can't even remember the name of it. What was the thing that you put on the card that you can scan? Uh, the QC, the, the QR code. The QR, the QR, yeah. uh, QR, surrender QR codes. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, so that's happening, right? That's, that's a real thing. It's happening. It's a real thing. Now, what's sort of complicated about what's happening in, in Ukraine is that there's about, it's not one Russian army. There's about, Five armies 
on the Russian side. There's there's the there's a Russian um, there's the Russian army the the army itself. There is Russian the paratroopers VDV paratroopers. They have their own different command structure outside of the army. There's Rusvardia. Rusvardia are actually National Guard. They are Putin's private army. Putin doesn't trust the army because he's a dictator. Dictators know that armies are what well, <laughs> you know their biggest threat. So he has his own private army, the Rusvardia. So they are also in in Ukraine. There is the Chechen. The uh, Chechens have their own private army also functioning. There's the Wagner uh, mercenaries. These are, uh, these are literally mercenaries. Um, they're the worst of the worst. They're also in, in, uh, in Ukraine. So there are, there are groups. And then there's the, the proxies, the two Ukrainian, um, in the Donbass, the Ukrainian armies that are aligned with Russia. Ironically, what we're seeing right now this week is that Russians have fled that entire northeastern corner. It is those Ukrainian proxy forces that are actually putting up the biggest fight right now. And it is my hope that uh, that an arrangement can be made with that entire region. Because if, if, if Ukraine could get those guys to, to lay down their arms and surrender, it would, it would dramatically shape. And these guys have, they've suffered the most. They get thrown into the front lines because Putin doesn't want his people dying, right? So he'll throw in the Ukrainian aligned, um, proxy forces to, to the front to, to do most of the dying. And they've just been really crapped on for, for years. I mean, this war really has been going since 2014. So I had this sort of fantasy that, that, that Ukraine can somehow broker, if not a surrender, there could be a um, sort of an orange revolution in those regions to overthrow the Russian-backed uh, proxy government. So, it, so it's complicated. So the Russians are running, the uh, or or surrendering if, they, if they're cut off, and a lot of them were cut off. I mean, the, this this advance happened so quickly. Market happened so quickly that I was looking at a map, and now it's going. There's no way Ukraine's in that town unless we gave them teleporters. There was no. They just did not seem possible, but um, it was. <laughs> it totally was. It was crazy, and um, so yeah. So some people are, are 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 surrendering, but a lot of them are still fighting. Russians are running right now. I don't see Russians fighting much anywhere, but a lot of those other groups are fighting. There's Rusvardia are fighting. The Chechens are fighting. So it's it's really complicated. Bit of a mismatch, and um, and. Um, it, 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 there's not a there's not like a unified command we can look to and say okay they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna surrender or they're gonna pull back it's it's just but it also it also means that it's chaos and it's always been part of that chaos the last five months and it sort of showed up that one of the few places that Russia's advancing is this town it's near this town called Bakhmut and this is being assaulted by Wagner mercenaries and when the front was collapsing in that northeast corner of the country. They were asked to to move up there to reinforce Russian lines to try to stop the the Ukrainian advance, and their response was, "We're the only people that are advancing anywhere in this country. We got it. We're doing fine in our corner. We're going to stay here." So there's never a sense of like, there's no unified commander that is that is doing this. Like they all they all have, all have their own agendas, and even in the army. It seems like there's no unified commander because the south is by the southern district of Russia's army and, and the east is the western district. And even those generals don't like each other and aren't working together. It's, it's a, everything about the Russian war effort has been an absolute disaster. You're saying this might be over by Christmas, but if this continues the way it's going and it doesn't look like there's going to be any serious turnaround, I mean, I, I'm I'm no student of, of war, military college, but everything you've described, you know, it, it doesn't take uh, <laughs> an expert to know this just isn't working. Uh, it, it, but I have to ask you this, though, if this goes, continues in this way, and if Russia loses, it has to pull out, it all falls apart, what will Putin have accomplished? What will he have gained, even at home? Anything? Is there anything salvageable from this decision he's no 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 he's 
if if he loses and he's going to lose, it, it he's done. Russia does not do well with uh, with losers. Does not treat them well. And you know what's happening already is we're seeing uh, two wars break out in Central Asia um, just this week alone in in Armenia being a, uh, invaded by Azerbaijan and Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are lobbying artillery shells at each other and um, and uh, Uzbekistan is making googly eyes at China and signing something with China. There's a sense already that that Russia held a lot of those former former Soviet republics in Central Asia together by force. And now that Russia is essentially toast, we're going to see, we're seeing those regions flare up. And it's just like, you know, Mark, you, you look at Africa, right? And you know how the colonialists drew boundaries based on what they want, not based on like where tribes were. And and so that's that's created a lot of the conflict you see in, in continuous conflict you see in Africa, right? These lines were not drawn in any real sensible way that reflected who lived in those areas? The same thing is happening in Central Asia. These were lines written, drawn by colonial Russia. And so you have, in, in the reason you have uh, war in Armenia and, and, um, and um, that corner is because um, the lines were, you know, Armenians are on the wrong side of the border, right? So 10 years ago, Armenia invaded set up a, you know, the boundaries are on the plates and now it's, they're getting pushed back out, right? So, and if you talk to somebody, you say, well, you know, you invaded 10 years ago and they'll be like, yeah, but in 1477, and if you get that sort of historical, well, we were here first, but no, we were here first. And, and those, those are like what you see in the Middle East and Israel and Palestine, like those, those arguments, nobody wins those arguments, right? They're just a recipe for endless perpetual war. So you're getting that in those republics. You're starting to get that also a little bit of rumblings in the um, in the Russian Federation colonies. There's there's you know the Russian Federation is like 150 different regions, and they're starting to get a little antsy. And what's even worse is that in a bid to reinforce Ukraine, that Ukrainian war effort without having a general mobilization, Putin created regional armies. So they, they, they stood up armies in some of these areas and then armed them. And what's interesting is that a lot of them aren't deploying the Ukraine. They're staying right home. And so Putin may have just armed his, in, you know, an actual resistance movement against the Russian Federation. Um, so it's, it's the, the sad thing, Mark, is that it's Russia held everything. That whole part of the world was held together by fear and might. And now that Russia has shown that it, 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 there's no reason to fear it and there is no might and its actual armed forces are being decimated, there's going to be a lot of war and strife in, in that region. So that, that's the downside. And it's going to be one of those where nobody cares, right? Or, ah, whatever. It's like, but a lot of people are going to die. There's going to be a lot of instability. There's nuclear weapons in a lot of those places. And uh, so it's going, to be, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare scenario. And um, I actually think that the U.S. would prefer that Putin stay in power and hold things together, but I don't know if that's possible anymore. I don't think anybody can will that anymore. All right. We will monitor that. And folks, again, uh, coast.dailycoast.com to, to really follow the daily Ukraine news and information as Marcos has been doing very well as a veteran himself. Um, you and I have been talking the past couple of weeks in terms of the midterms and the, the impact um, that the Dobbs decision to reverse Roe is obviously having. Um, Lindsey Graham, some are saying he's helped with his proposal, <laughs> which, which, and, and even, even Republicans are wondering, well, they're not responding there. I guess they're wondering, you know, what, what he's really up to, why he's doing this, the time has been bad. Uh, Mitch McConnell, when asked, said this. Well, with regard to his bill, you'll have to ask him about it. In terms of scheduling, I think most of the members of my conference prefer that this be dealt with at the state level. So even McConnell not embracing what Graham is doing. What, so does this help? It helps us. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, our argument, they claim that, oh, it's about, it's just what Mitch McConnell says. And Mitch McConnell lies. So he's lying right there. But Mitch McConnell says, oh, we want it to be left to the states. Um, Lindsey Graham himself tweeted that after Dobbs. He tweeted like, the Supreme Court made a right choice. This should be left up to the states. That's where it really belongs. It's really perplexing because Republicans, like you said, we've been talking about it. They've been running away from abortion. They're scrubbing their websites. They're trying to change this topic. They're desperately wanting to 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 negate the uh, sort of this abortion issue, which completely has reshaped the entire midterm election. A lot of things are helping. Abortion is like the catalyst to eighty percent of it. And to the point now where, where, you know, I think Democrats will pick up seats in the Senate and have a really solid chance to, to hold the House. So the um, Mitch McConnell knows this. He, he's a strategist. He, he wants to be majority leader again. And he's seen this go up in smokes. And, and, and Lindsey Graham doesn't have a single Senate co-sponsor for this radical bill. And... Nobody really understands why he thought he needed to to basically be a hypocrite about his old position to drag this thing out. And uh, of course, every Democrat is running with it. And and talking about Lindsey Graham's and a Republican's national abandon. The reality is that that Republicans do want this and they want to do it when they have the majority. And so, Mark, what, what Tuck Schumer should do is they, they should put this on the floor. Put it on the floor. I mean, it can't pass, right? Because we still have a filibuster. It's at elite 60. But make them vote for or against it. And there's then there's no, they can't run for it. They're on the record. And so, and we have plenty, both House and the Senate. You know, we have we have Bud, who's in the House, running in North Carolina. Obviously, Marco, Marco Rubio in Florida. And, and Ron Johnson in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin. So... Absolutely, absolutely put this up for a vote right now. But I it's it's amazing, Mark. I, I don't I don't understand what Lindsey Graham thinks he's doing. And um he's just we I mean, I don't think we need a lot of help, but okay, give us more. <laughs> give us more to play with. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 no, it it's um it's it's really something. Um meanwhile, Nancy Pelosi, have you been talking to the speaker? She's she's con- as confident as you are uh, <laughs> that Democrats will win the House. She's even said Democrats are going to pick up pick up seats. I mean, it. So th- there's 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 sort of there are people who are like looking at the polls and the polls are gaudy good for the Democrats, and they say the polling's been wrong before. And yeah, the, the polling's been wrong before. The good thing right now, Mark, and we've talked about this, is that we don't need to look at the polling. We can look at actual election results. We've had 11 special elections, 12 special elections this year. And after the Dobbs decision, the average Democratic overperformance from 2020 is seven points. That is, the country is seven points to the left of where, of where Joe Biden was in 2020. If we can keep it at three, I mean, zero means we hold. I mean, zero means we hold, because we did last time. And the House is slightly more Democratic in gerrymandering this year, just it by two, three seats. So just keeping it at the 2020 numbers, we hold the House, pick up seats in the Senate. But we're actually six points ahead. And I keep going back. You know, we talked, I think we talked about New York 19th, right? The New York 19th special election, because it was, it was a 50, 48 Biden seat. This is exact. There are 222 seats more Democratic than this one. And the Democrats won it by two and a half points. But what made that even more incredible is that Republicans spent over a million dollars with their best candidate anywhere this cycle. The Democrats did not spend a single dime because it's a rental. It's a five month seat. It doesn't exist in the new Congress because of, because of re, reapportionment. And uh, we still won. They still, you know, the Democrats still overperformed Joe Biden, even though they got outspent a million to nothing. And that uh, they tried and we didn't really try. It's crazy. So that's what we're looking at. And the voter registration data, a lot of young people, a lot of women, heavily Democratic. In Pennsylvania, it's, it's off the charts. It's hundreds of thousands of new Democrats flooding in, not a lot of new Republicans. 
Um, and to a lesser extent, we're seeing that in, in all the battleground states. So Republicans are in real trouble, which is why they're, they're really like flipping out about, about, um, about Lindsey Graham. And as soon as this dies down in a couple of days, watch it, there's going to be more Donald Trump news. So they can't even get a word in edgewise trying to get whatever their message might be. Yeah. And, 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 Jan- and January 6th, they are going to hold more hearings, I think, before the election. I, I oh, think yeah. That's-, that's coming. Yeah. yeah. And you got, you got subpoenas, you got my pillow guy being, I guess they <laughs> tripped him in, in Hardee's. <laughs> they took his phone. I don't know anybody who goes to Hardee's anymore. I mean, this guy's supposed to be a, what, a gazillionaire, multi-million, you know, worth a couple hundred million dollars and you're going to Hardee's? Okay. Okay. Hardee's, y'all. Got all that money. Maybe we're missing some. Maybe we, they, I'm in New York. There aren't any Hardee's in New York, really. Maybe there's some in Jersey. I mean, <laughs> well, this is not even about being a food snob. There's so much actual good food nowadays, right? Back in the old days, there were like good paquerias and good Ethiopian restaurants and good, uh, you know, it was, it was, food was pretty bland back in those days. And uh, now things are different. There's good options. But no, Hardee's, I guess. Okay. Got, got his cell phone at Hardee's. They, they seized the cell phone at Hardee's. So, yeah. Um, there's the cat. <laughs> um, the clown. Yeah, no question about it. All right, folks, uh, the brief civics with the Q, Daily Coast, and follow. Again, Marcos has been doing incredible work. Uh, as I've said before, he's worthy of being on some of these shows where they have these other military experts and retired generals. He can, he can, he can stand toe to toe with some of them in terms of his coverage of what's been going on in Ukraine. So be sure to check that out as well. Coast out the coast.com. Follow him on Twitter at Marcos. Marcos, thanks as always, buddy. Thank you so much. Talk to you next week. Oh, actually, yeah. Okay. You're not going to talk to me next week, but, <laughs> okay. but oh, the week after. Okay. My, my, son is, my son is graduating from uh, infantry school, so I'm very, very proud of, uh, of the uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, for his, his graduation. I'm pretty excited about that. Congratulations. That's great, man. Congratulations to him. I know you're proud. Wonderful. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister or brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.